start that over again. I'm Kat Romano, and I'm the Programming and Human Rights Coordinator at the Montreal Holocaust Museum. I want to welcome everyone to our event, The Amazing Life of Margot Oyman, Screening and Discussion. It feels very meaningful to be hosting this event today as part of Pride Month um, to give voice to the lesser known stories of members of the LGBTQIA plus community um, during the Holocaust. We're so great, grateful for our partners today on this event. Um, one partner is Temple Emmanuel Beth Shalom. It's a reform synagogue in Westmount, Quebec. It's the oldest liberal or reform synagogue in Canada and it was incorporated on March 30th, 1883, and is the only reformed congregation in Quebec and Eastern Canada. Um, our other partner is Keshet, and Keshet works for the full equality of LGBTQ Jews and families in Jewish life. They strengthen Jewish communities and equip Jewish organizations with the skills and knowledge to build LGBTQ affirming communities, create spaces in which all queer Jewish youth feel seen and valued and advance LGBTQ rights nationwide. Here at the Montreal Holocaust Museum, we aim to educate people of all ages and backgrounds about the Holocaust while sensitizing the public to the universal perils of anti-Semitism, racism, hate, and indifference. Through, its commemor through our commemorative programs and educational in initiatives, the museum promotes respect for diversity and the sanctity of human life. If you're in Montreal, uh, we invite you to visit our permanent exhibition as well as, um, and if you're not in Montreal, to visit our website and explore our many virtual exhibits and survivor testimonies. We'll be sending out links to those in our um, post-event email. Before I hand over the floor to um, Edith, I wanted to go over a bit of housekeeping. Everyone will be kept on mute during the event. Um, the conversation between Dr. Haikova, Dr. Hughes, and Rabbi Grushko will be followed by a Q&A, during which everyone will be able to ask questions by writing them into the chat. Um, if you think of questions during the discussion, feel free to drop them into the chat, and we'll be monitoring that throughout. If you have any technical difficulties, you can message me and I'll try to help you as best as I can. <laughs> um, um, and also as a reminder, um, you can all watch um, the play until tomorrow evening. We'll be also sending out a link to that in our follow-up email. And so now I'd like to introduce Edith Klein, um, who will be uh, introducing the event and our speakers. So Edith, is a Edith Klein is a national leader for social justice with more than 25 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. Since 2001, she has served as the CEO and president of Keshet. Edith built Keshet from a local organization to a national organization with offices in six states. Under her leadership, Keshet has supported tens of thousands of rabbis, educators, and other Jewish leaders to make LGBTQ equality a communal value and moral imperative. Edith also spearheaded the creation of leadership development programs for queer Jewish teens and mobilized Jewish communities nationwide to join the fight for LGBTQ rights. In addition, she served as the executive producer of Keshet's documentary film, Hineni, coming out in a Jewish high school. And now I will pass it over to Edith. Thank you so much, Kat. Hello, everyone, and happy Pride. Um, I've spoken at Holocaust programs before, but I think this is the first Holocaust program I've spoken at that I have opened with happy Pride. Um, it's not a, a usual way to introduce such a program, and that, of course, is what makes this event so distinctive. So I come from a family of survivors um, and a family who lost many in the Holocaust, and I grew up with a lot of stories. One of the stories that I've always cherished is a love story. It's the story of my great uncle, Joe, who met the woman who would become his wife, Laura, before the war. They met very briefly. And as the story goes, it was love at first sight. And Joe talks, or at least for Joe, and Joe talks about how um, throughout the many months of um, deprivation and horror and suffering in Auschwitz, it was his love for Flora which fueled his live to live. And such that um, as soon as he gained the strength to walk after liberation, he walked the many miles from Poland to Flora's hometown in Czechoslovakia, sleeping in frozen fields and cornfields at night, hoping and 
hoping that he would find her alive when he arrived. And he tells the story of knocking on her window at five in the morning, just as dawn was breaking and her face appearing at the window. And I will never forget how his face lit up time and time again when he would tell the story over and over of how her face appeared. And as he said, and it felt like the whole world was the sun and she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. So I love this love story within my own family. And when I came out, when I was in college, of course, I wondered about queer love stories during the Holocaust. And I soon learned about some love stories between men, but it wasn't until I encountered Margot's story that I learned about love between women. I love how the through line throughout her experience before the war and throughout her time in camps was her love for another woman. That that is the single most prominent theme she returns to again and again in her oral history that is chronicled in the play that we are featuring today. And that that continued to live so strongly in Margot throughout her life. Her story for me is a testament to the indomitable power of love. And at a time in the United States and in so many parts of the world, though thankfully not so much in Canada where most of you live, at a time in which LGBTQ rights are increasingly under attack and under severe attack, I so appreciate Margot's reminder of what is really at the heart of our movement, our movement for dignity and equality, that what is at the heart of it is love. That is the goal, that is the impetus, and we know that that is what will get us through. And now I'm so delighted and honored to turn to our speakers today and offer a few words of introduction. Today's discussion will be moderated by Rabbi Lisa Grushko. Rabbi Grushko received her BA from McGill University in 1996. She was then named a Rhodes Scholar and spent three years at Oxford earning a master's and then a doctorate. She was ordained as a rabbi in 2003 at the Hebrew Union College in New York City, and today serves as senior rabbi at Temple Emmanuel Beth Shalom in Montreal, as Kat said earlier. She also served as the past president of the Montreal Board of Rabbis. She is the author of Writing the Wayward Wife and the editor of The Sacred Encounter, Jewish Perspectives on Sexuality. As an out lesbian rabbi, Rabbi Grushko strives to create a community that is truly embracing a community in which people grow up knowing always that their religious tradition has a place for them to be their full selves. She'll be moderating the conversation between Dr. Anna Haikova and Dr. Erica Hughes, who co-authored the play, The Amazing Life of Margot Human. Dr. Anna Haikova is the Associate Professor at the University of Warwick, where she co-directs the Center for Global Jewish Studies. Her landmark study of Theresienstadt the Last Ghetto, An Everyday History of Theresienstadt came out in 2020 with Oxford University Press. She is a pioneer of queer Holocaust history and her work has been awarded the 2020 Orfe Orfeo Iris Prize. Dr. Erica Hughes is a reader in performance at the University of Portsmouth in the South of England. She is a theater director, dramaturg and scholar whose work has been supported by the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, the US State Department, and the UK Research and Innovation. Her work as a director has been seen on stages in the US, Canada, the UK, Pakistan, Germany, Austria, and Israel. She is the author of Holocaust Memory and Youth Performance, which is forthcoming as a publication from Bloomsbury Methuen Drama in January. In addition to co-authoring the play, she directed it. Rabbi Grushko. Thank you, Edith. It's such a it's such an honor and privilege and pleasure to be here with you and with the others in this event. And I'm grateful to you and to Kat for bringing us all together. And so I really want us to dive right into our program, into our conversation. And I would love to begin by asking Dr. Hughes and Dr. Haikova how they came to this project originally. What brought you to it? Uh, what inspired you to bring it to life and to do so in the ways that you did? Help, help us know the story behind the story. Okay, I will start because chronologically I met Margot first. Um, I started like seven years ago working on queer Holocaust history. I wrote my PhD in Toronto 
on Theresienstadt and the book was kind of finished. And I started working on same sex desire coming out of my work on sex shit and Holocaust, which is kind of one of the big trends I saw in the audience, Alexandra Natoli, who is uh, doing great work on bodies and materiality in Auschwitz. So she's my witness and she's my um, also my evidence. And I knew that there was this incredible epistemic injustice of erased queer love because historians such as Insa Eschebach and others have written very bold and a daring work on homophobia in the camps. So for the longest time, I thought what I would be doing would be archaeology of loss. And then one day in 2017, I got an email from Linda Hoyman saying, I heard about your work. Do you want to meet my aunt? And that was Margot. And it was a great accident because not only was Margot somebody who was an out lesbian who experienced her first love in Theresienstadt in Auschwitz and Hamburg, but also she was in the very same camps and ghettos about which I was writing. She was in Theresienstadt about which I was finishing a book and she was in Neungamme about which I was starting to produce a book. So as soon as I could, I visited her in Arizona. We hung out, I interviewed her. We stayed friends. Um, she was tremendous and uh, full of humor. And she liked to comment on Facebook on my statuses. Uh, very mischievous. And then in 2020, we had the heat wave like we are starting to have uh, now in England. And Erica and I were hanging out. I was always fascinated by Erica's intellectual commitment to think hard how to tell stories for teenagers about the Holocaust that are not sentimentalized and that dare to put the whole stories out there. And we talked and talked and I said, how have you written a play? How does one write a play? Should we write a play together? Because I really enjoy my friendship with Erika and I always think about what can we do more together because working with her is so pleasurable and she's a very cool friend and a brilliant scholar. And with that, I will segue to her. Oh, yay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so this is, I think it is really important to say that this was really a, um, uh, this is a collaboration that um, I think in many respects actually began when Anna and I met in the Holocaust Museum um, back in 2010. And so I work on um, Holocaust representation um, through performance um, for young audiences. Um, there's not too many of us in this field, but um, the amazing Valerie Zatzman, who's here tonight, uh, who's at York, is also an expert in this field. So hi, Valerie. And, um, but that is to say that, uh, so for a number of years, I've been thinking really about, um, yeah, as Anna said, different ways in which to tell uh, stories on stage and to different um, audiences. And um, the Holocaust is often told um, to young audiences uh, through the theater, but very, but almost always in a very heteronormative way. And, um, and in an incredibly prescribed heteronormative gendered way. And, uh, and so Anna um, and I had wanted to do a project together. And then um, uh, we talked about a number of different uh, ideas. And um, Margaret's story really appealed to me for a number of reasons. Um, one, because it is a beautiful story, but two, because she's also, she was a young person when she experienced this. And so, um, uh, you know, she was 14. So this is, you know, she was around the same age as, as so many of the protagonists that we that we know very well. Of course, most famously Anna Frank, but there there are many. Actually, Canada has a fantastic kind of um, uh, canon of youth Holocaust plays. It's really sophisticated. Um, I should add, I'm not Canadian. I'm uh, from the United States, um, and so jealous. But um, but uh, but so that is to say that the opportunity just seemed really perfect for us to um, to collaborate. Um, so then we started looking at different forms, um, uh, and then settled on uh, documentary theater. You know, it's so interesting to hear some of that context. For me, as a, a parent of teens, I'm struck by how much. YA literature has expanded in recent years to include queer stories in ways that were absolutely unthinkable when I was a kid. And of course, you have and have had for a long time significant amount of YA literature for um, related to themes of the Holocaust, but never the twain shall meet, right? And I think similar in, in many of the adult conversations, we have conversations about queer life and history over here and Holocaust over there. And maybe we speak about overlap between what happened to Jews and what happened to queer folk, but not often people who were, who were both, right? And so I'm curious, um, maybe starting with Dr. Haikova, how, how your relationship with Margot developed, how she came to tell her story, not only as a, as a 
child survives, a young woman who lived through this, but as a queer young woman who lived through this. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's also great to have a question from you, a out lesbian rabbi. Um, and thank you again for, uh, for being here and um, being in conversation with us. There were two things that were immensely important. I'm an out lesbian woman and I'm a third generation. Um, and my uh, my family who was in the recent chat, none of them came uh, back. So that also really um, shaped the way how I wrote about the recent chat in my first book. Um, and it was a nice change in uh, the work on Margot to talk about somebody who survived, even though most of her family did not survive. So Margot, who testified many times, she gave an interview to the Holocaust Museum, to the so-called Spielberg Foundation. Um, she even cooperated with Mary Sidlin about the Defiant Requiem. And quite often she, she always spoke about Emma as a very special friend. So I guess if you were an authentic um, queer listener, you, you picked on that, but you needed to know. And it was only to me because she felt safe that she told the whole story, but it was also remarkable in the four or five days that I spent with her is quite often she assured herself of my queerness and would ask various questions about, you know, my, my lesbian practice. Sometimes the questions were, let's say, very inquisitive and I had to be like, we are not going this topic, but it was also the particular charm. And I guess the bigger, the meta level here is Margot was very skilled at testifying and she knew very well what she's welcome to say and what would not be welcome. And part of my work looks at other queer survivors who tried to testify and who were not listened to. I have this uh, Czech Jewish resistance fighter who tries to constantly tell her interviewer about a very important woman in her life, her flatmate. And he's like, let's talk about your real family, not about your flatmate. And of course, for somebody coming from 1960 San Francisco, flatmate uh, was the code for a partner or for a wife. It's not necessarily that she was hiding herself. So Margot needed the safe space where she's welcome and cherished. And I also saw through her over time how she could basically script herself and tell a different story. Because one or two years later, uh, she was invited by the Noengame Memorial for the liberation festivity where she again gave testimony and she told the same story minus the queerness. And it was fascinating. And it's a very agentic moment that, you know, you, Erika, also write about, about testifying as agency. Can, Dr. Hughes, can you say a little bit more about that? Because I think one of the things that's, that's um, unique and special about this opportunity is we focus and rightly so on on hearing testimonies on what bearing witness on hearing people tell their stories um but i don't know that many of us who aren't in the field really go deeper in our in our thinking about that necessarily which is interesting right because as a rabbi you're always thinking about how texts are written and how stories are told but but say a little perhaps about that in your work and if it intersects maybe how it led you to this particular genre of documentary theater yeah, so I think you know one of the things about uh, about documentary theater um, is that I think it um, uh, it certainly allows for not just kind of a deep dive into into the archive, but a kind of an embodied dive into the archive. Because and so um, the actual practice of editing was uh, of writing and editing this um, this play was actually one where Anna and I were reading out loud the testimony to one another. So there was something about that process that, you know, because I've, I mean, Anna and I have both done, you know, traditional archival research where nobody talks in an archive, right? The whole point is you're supposed to be quiet so people can kind of listen to what's going on in their minds and, and read silently. But, but there was something about um, reading the testimony out loud and hearing how it lands that, um, uh, th that can open up, I think, just just as you know, as Anna was saying, you know, there's certain coded terms that uh, the theater maker can um, uh, can help unpack. So it, it might just be a kind of a word or a turn of phrase, you know, but the theater maker can can highlight that based on their own craft, pausing or emphasizing, you know. Um, there's something in the body, you know, where you could say you could say flatmate or you could say my flatmate. 
right? And so there's something about taking that um, that la that layer, uh, that interpretive layer, into um, the process of crafting uh, history, because we really we really think of um, documentary theater as a as really a historical historiographical process. And so, you know, what we've we've looked to make is not a traditional play, but rather really something more akin to to another history work. Um, uh, and so, so the, this act of testifying is one that's interpreted not just by how you kind of which which words you select on the flat page, um, but what you take into uh, not just a three D space, you know, but also an oral space, you know, a space of of hearing and listening, um, and of animating it with your face with with your body. So, did you consider going further on that and making it more of a traditional? play more of a traditional dramatic project or was that never on the table? Well, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that we did was, um, you know, I think anytime you do a play that um, the more times you get to actually perform it live, it kind of takes on its own quality, but this was a COVID project. Um, and I should add, so my colleague, um, uh, Phoebe Rumsey, Dr. Phoebe Rumsey is here as well. And, and she read the words of Anna in the play. And so we might want to even kind of pull Phoebe Rumsey into the into this briefly to see if uh, she was to add anything as well. She did such a beautiful job. But, um, you know, one of the things that this project was, was a COVID project. And so what that meant was we, we recorded it. Originally, we had thought to do it live for Brighton Fringe Festival. And for those of you who don't know, Brighton um, in the UK has um, the largest fringe festival uh, in England, uh, second largest in the UK, second to Edinburgh, and Brighton is the San Francisco of the UK. It, it, it has the largest and most fabulous concentration of, of vibrant queer life um, in the United Kingdom, and so it was really important for us to think about that as a Brighton locale for our first thing. And then COVID happened, and so we had to kind of record it, uh, and we had very limited amount of time. Um, Having said that, it was really important to me as a director that the actors would always carry the script with them because one thing that we really didn't want to have was verisimilitude. What we wanted to have was an understanding that this is, you know, not traditional acting where you have one body standing in for another, um, but rather you have um, you have a, a it's an engagement with testimony. So you, you, in so doing, you're trying to make present what's not there or who's who's not there. So um, carrying those scripts was something that was really key to the approach uh, that we had to begin with. And so, um, interestingly enough, I don't know. I think it probably would have led to more of a struggle had the actors been doing this again and again and again because you inherently memorize things even if you try not to. Um, so it would have been really interesting to see. You know, I think there are Brechtian techniques whereby you might change who who is acting it. We could have had them swap roles. You know, we could have in, invited a kind of a um, I don't want to say a discomfort, but a lack of complacency, so that there's there's a constant discovery in the physical archive that we're we're really trying to to show. And I think that's what really my sense is that's what's really happened um, for my colleagues. Um, I don't know if we want to maybe pin Phoebe, Cat, if you want to maybe pin Phoebe and see if uh, I'm putting her on the spot as well. She's in a train station. <laughs> Hello, I'm in a train station right now. Whoops. Welcome. Oh, yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, I'll just say briefly because I'm in Waterloo Station in London, but um, yeah, that effect of um, carrying the script around was really fascinating as an actor because I was not ever trying to be the role. So it got to feel very raw throughout the whole process. And that's a fascinating idea, Erica, switching the roles for a moment um, because Aisha, the other actor and I, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out the story together. Um, very much, I suppose, a meta of Anna and Margot themselves in their interviews. So it, it kept a very freshness to it. Well, I, I guess this, the last thing I would add is as the interviewer, I was so impressed by how much openness there was to respond to all these questions, which as they go along, there's, they're, they're very specific and, and asking you know, for her details and, and stuff and, and just the warmth that came back um, from Margot and, and then of course from the other actors. So it was a real pleasure. And I might, I'll just also add, I'm Canadian. So hello, Canada, I miss you. <laughs> yeah. But it's all I'll say, cause it's a little noisy here, but it's just a pleasure to listen to you all talk about it. Yeah. No, thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate that. And I do think that that effect of carrying the scripts really does have an impact, right? It really does show it to be a different kind of theater, a different kind of 
engagement. I'm really struck by what you said about it being a COVID project, because I think that that COVID made all of us experience time differently. Um, and I think that that um, depending on where you or your family members are in life, to kind of have two or three years where life is not as usual had a different impact, right? Um, especially if one's towards the beginning or towards the end of one's story. And I know that there's increasingly this sense of urgency in terms of Holocaust testimonials and people telling their stories. And I wonder whether you could take this one of two directions or both. I wonder whether that was accentuated by COVID for the two of you in telling and creating the story. And I wonder how much of it is shaped by the fact that it's still relatively new to tell queer Holocaust stories, even though we've been telling Holocaust stories for such a long time. Could you could you talk about that? Okay. I mean, I think, yeah, for me personally, yeah, I think actually, I think it's it's a really the sort of the general urgency because of just the way in which time is moving and then the kind of what COVID gave me in a, in a in an interesting way was was a kind of a quietness and a space to actually stop and contemplate. And so, you know, it was um, uh, unusual for me in some respects. In that, I mean, COVID was you know, as we were saying even before the the talk. You know, COVID was of course tons and tons and tons of extra labor and work and and a very different way of of working. But because time really shifted, it also meant that there were large swaths of kind of very introspective time. And um, and I can't help but think that that really did have an impact. And then for me personally, you know, I think um, uh, you know, in, in addition to being somebody who is part of the queer community, who's bi, who's very um, also connected to family members of mine who are also queer and uh, queer lesbians of a, of a certain generation who are older than me, I think there was also um, uh, uh, some of whom are Jewish. Um, there was also for me, I think, a real impetus to make a story for family members of mine who are also later in life in late stage. So it wasn't just about preserving so it was about preserving and 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 you know um, honoring Margot's story, but then also wanting to get it out to a certain population as well, who's also later, uh, who's later in life. And of course, I think COVID in that sense also really added to to the urgency because I you know um, uh, I, I certainly started thinking about the mortality of of my my family members, particularly those who are later in um, later in life as well. I think differently. Um. I come from a slightly different situation about this question and I get this question a lot and I think it's an important question but also I, I loved how you said Rabbi people towards the end of the story lifespan has a span people are born they live and they die and it's natural and it's good I grew up surrounded by survivors um, and my grandparents grew very old and then they got sick and then they died and uh, that's now 10 eight years and it was that was very sad but I also thought they had a good life they had a good run at, of it so in that sense I don't feel it so existentially that survivors are dying because that was for me for the fact of life and I wanted I wanted my grandparents to have a good end because not all of them had a good end and that sucks uh so I guess I have this very kind of third generation relationship to it and not an abstract one I do want to um, segue a little bit to the last question about uh, why documentary theater. Something that we were very aware uh, is that this is not a story that will be welcomed by all. And putting it forward as a documentary theater on top of other reasons and our admiration for this Bremer company, like Bremen in Germany, uh, from the files to the stage, was also our um, awareness that th there may be people who say if this is like a play that we write in a dramatic way that we fictionalize that we made it up and that it never happened because as you said this is for such a story um, and I think it was on Monday that it was um, the anniversary 94th anniversary of Anne Frank's birthday and Anne Frank has um, queer traces in her diary I have written about it Jerry Han has written about it and the people have written about it that I wrote a thread on Twitter where I spent a fair bit of time and I was even even at my stage in life, I have been in this radio for a, a while. I was taken aback how the threat was attacked by two camps, by TERFs, which you know is expected whenever you say the word TERF, uh, queer, TERFs come and say, ah. But what 
suppressed. So I'm going to ask you to explain that for those who might oh, not understand. So it, in, in England, it's quite frequent. TERFs are transphobic, um, exclusionary, trans exclusionary radical feminists. It's transphobic feminists, but usually we use TERFs as people who hate trans people or deny the existence of trans people. Um, and they spend a lot of time on social media um, trying to be unpleasant and they manage. But the thing that I want to mention is perhaps more relevant here for the point of why we chose for documentary theater where everything that is in the play are words that have been spoken and we didn't add anything that we just condensed for clarity um, was that there was a fair bit of Jewish voices even by you know people with heft and a huge following who either said don't trust the queers because they are sodomites uh, or she's not Jewish don't trust her and only Jews have the right to speak on behalf of Jews. Um, and I disagree with both. And um, I also found it very upsetting how people do not engage with what I'm saying. I'm not particularly complaining about what happened on Monday, but I'm bringing it here as an example that uh, there is not a universal love and celebration of bringing queer Holocaust history to the table, which is why I really love the story with which it opened. There are the queer love stories, and there is a very important reason why we hear about them only today and also against some resistance. Can you say more either of you about what kind of reaction this project and this uh, this creation has received? I mean, I think it's been largely positive. Um, and um, I think a couple of things, I think it's been really, when people understand what we're trying to do with documentary theater, if they kind of think, you know, if they feel like they're going to see a traditional film or a particularly kind of traditional, um, I say with scare quotes, because there's many, there's a million ways to do Holocaust performance. But but I think if people are expecting a very particular kind of Holocaust performance, this might be really different. And so I think it's um, um, often best kind of um, understood when people understand what, you know, the kind of underpinnings of the form are. But having said that, it's overwhelmingly positive. However, um, you know, last couple of months ago, I uh, brought it to Oklahoma State University. And that was a really interesting space because um, they have a fantastic women's studies program there and a fantastic history program there. And um, and so they were they were wonderful hosts and it was really wonderful audience. At the same time, there were a couple of um, there was one one individual in particular who really challenged uh, whether or not this was a true story in the talk back. And, um, you yeah, know, and, and a lot of the discourse around challenging that, I think, was really had more to do with contemporary particularly in the United States discourse um, uh, that's really challenging, um, you know, LGBTQIA plus um, uh, rights to exist. Um, so, so I think, you know, we have to sort of really think about, uh, so I'm always trying to kind of take that in, in addition to just anti-Semitism. And so having to kind of hold that, um, you know, the, the resistance um, to this can come from a number of different directions has been, um, I think, a real place of learning um, for me. Um, but then I think it also really, you know, incentivizes me to get it out into communities that that might not otherwise um, hear these stories, even more so. Yeah, I want to say, um, if if I may blow our own horn, you know, we we put some thought into how we are doing it, and to bring forward to one story that would be really difficult to push against. This is a coming of age story of a young girl who survived thanks to love. And she is a wholly positive figure, but she's also full of humor and of sparkle and of personality. So she's not, you know, like an icon. She's just a very real person who you really grow to like and played enormously well by Asha Evans. Um, we were also very curious how Margot would react to the play. And Margot quite enjoyed having the attention. And when I wrote about her and the article went viral and somebody wrote her Wikipedia page and then she had let's say ambivalent feelings about Wikipedia page. And she watched the play and now I'll first contradict myself and then come back to it. And I thought she found it a bit, um, not quite as sparkly and exciting as somebody who had a lifelong subscription to Metropolitan Opera uh, would have expected. Having said that, um, some people, come to our play and think this is like a goodwill thing. They will go and see it because they really like me or they really like Erica. So they're doing us a favor. And then they come to the play and they 
come out after four to five minutes and they say, I smiled, I cried, I was scared away. This is, I thought this would be very dull, but it's not dull. And we are like, yeah, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to do a sweeping and true and real queer Holocaust history that will not be boring. And I think we succeeded. After all, we are invited to Montreal. I would agree 200%. And I also really love how Adit introduced this with this very moving love story from her own family. And there is that, that universality of love. I mean, I, I couldn't help but smile when I was watching. And there was the piece from Margot's testimony about, you know, well, how did you experience Eurasian style? Well, I was in love. So I was just happy that I was, you know, with the person that I loved. And that's such a... Um, I mean, who would say that but a teenager in love? And who can't relate to that, who was ever a teenager in love? And so there, there is that universality, but of course, we still have that huge gap between then and now in terms of what it means, what it meant to love somebody uh, of, the same, of the same gender at that time. Um, and I'm, I'm really struck Dr. Dr. Hykova about that curiosity she had about your life. And I wonder how much of that came from, well, what would it be like if I had been born later? After the Holocaust played out. Okay. I think there was no sound for a bit. Oh, did you lose me? Do you have me now? Yeah, but I think the question was like um, about the age difference and how it would have been for Margot had she not gone through the Holocaust. What the differences were. In this is indeed. I can restate it just while Lisa regains sound. Um, I think um, what she was asking is how her life may have been different had she been born at a later time. Yes, that was a big one. Um, and that is something that was very keenly for her presence. So um, uh, I, I have a partner uh, who uh, I've been together the past eight years. In fact, we are getting married this summer. Um, so by the time I interviewed uh, Margot, we were like an old established lesbian couple who does boring lesbian things. Um, and and one moment really remind, like stayed in my mind, or two. One was that it was not only by accident that we cast Aisha, who is, you know, um, in the early 20s, as Margot, who was then 15, 16, 17, because Margot in testifying and recalling the history was remarkably young. And I also experienced Margot around her um, child and grandchildren. And there she was the grandmother and somebody who was in her 80s and early 90s much more, um, is, is my, not scholarly, but is my, is my guess as her friend. Um, she also really enjoyed having moved in her when she was 88 to Arizona to this retired community and to come out. Not that nobody of her uh, relatives was surprised, but it really gave her a great freedom and she was surrounded by lots of friends who were also uh, queer women. And in fact, they invited us a couple of months ago to show the play to them. And it was very meaningful to them. And Margot really blossomed in this in this environment. Also, she had uh, arthritis um, and New York winters are as bad as Montreal winters, so almost as bad. Um, so that is something that uh, with me recalling the history that I knew so intimately, she could really go through the motions. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is, I, I still recall she, uh, Margot drove me to the airport in Tucson the first time I visited. Um, and I was about to fly via LA home to London. And I think it was before Easter. So I had some plans over Easter holidays when we have a day off and you have the long weekend. And Margot said, not necessarily sadly, but with a kind of wistfulness, you are going home to your partner and you have your whole life ahead of you and I will go home and I'm alone and I have nothing. And I thought that was very profound and like, you know, very sad. And um, it reminded me 
of course, of the things that I take for granted. Also, you know, guys, I'm Czech, I'm a dual citizen, I'm a citizen of the UK and of the Czech Republic, and I'm quite aware of things that my queer friends in Prague and elsewhere have different lands. They get spat on and they can't get married and they can't adopt children. And uh, that never happens here. And that is important. We need to fight for that. I'm so sorry about the dropping in and out, but I feel like it would be a great time to go to some Q&A to hear what questions I think those are coming through Edith's, so Edith things. Um, and I see at least one hand up from Shall I go ahead, Rabbi? So you can go ahead or you can write your question in the chat. Why don't you go ahead, Ray? And just for the sake of time, since we don't have a lot of time, if um, other people, um, you know, as you're speaking and, and as people respond, um, if you want to write your questions in the chat, then um, I can kind of group questions and share them um, with I'll be, our panelists. I'll be quick. I thought, thank you very much for this interesting discussion. Uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, the your core character is named human, and I thought if if she isn't essentially human, I don't know who is. And I want to compliment Phoebe Rumsey on her skill at interviewing. I, I've had lots of experience with that, and I think she handled the the context of the interview beautifully and had me listening very carefully. So thank you both. I did put a comment in the chat, but it's not for now. Wonderful, thank you, Ray. So again, um, feel free to share your questions for Dr. Haikova or Erica uh, or Rabbi Groshko in the chat. Okay, so there's a question. How did your conversation with Margot compare to interviews you've done with other survivors? Um, well, there were very few survivors with who I spent so much time. Um, and also with Margot, I was really interested in her queerness because her experiences in Auschwitz and Therese and that other details uh, were covered by uh, her other oral histories. And she definitely started forgetting details as she grew older. So I think she would remember this much more detail, say in 1992, she would be forgetting later on. Um, but there was this great uh, bonding and camaraderie, not only because we were two lesbians, not all lesbians in the world get along. Some lesbians hate each other, <laughs> take my word for it. Um, but um, I think it was really important that we had a chemistry and that we got along well and that we had um, a routine where in the morning we interviewed and we had like um, some plan that went to watch the cactuses or something and then around five o'clock we would have a campari and then she would check and say don't drink too much otherwise you will become an alcoholic. Um, so this this great sense of humor and uh, joie de vivre and uh, enjoying food, uh, that's something that was um, really special to Margot and she kept a great youth. Some of the survivors who I met and befriended interviewed uh, had that too. I would, however, say what Margot had in common, and this is a great question because I've not quite thought about it in a while, is... I think there are some novelists who have written about it, and I'm just blanking the name. It is often quite the old people that they are aware that they don't have to honor certain certain social norms. So they can ask all kinds of questions that they are curious about. They also maybe make you um make you sweat a bit. And I have seen that often with older gentlemen, and I saw it with Margot, not in a creepy way, but she definitely kind of, it was a very equal relationship, even though I had the knowledge that I was asking her. Um, and uh, like the comment said, I asked her a lot of questions um, and some of them went close to home and it was her choice which she will talk about it not, but she definitely, um, it was very much on the same eye level. Okay, our next question. I was confused when I watched the play. 
After liberation, what happened to Emma? They lost touch and then Emma was not gay. Could you clarify? So I think um, Anna should clarify what happened and then I'll clarify why we chose to keep that in the piece. Yeah. So in Belsen, the women who were super sick, which was a small group, were brought to Sweden or this group was brought to Sweden for recovery. And Margot was very sick um, and weakened after typhus, so she was brought to Sweden. Um, Emma was actually fairly fit and she was brought to England where her one surviving parent, uh, father who emigrated before the war, uh, lived. She was reunited with him. Um, she trained as a midwife um, and uh, later uh, in the early 50s um, actually moved to Canada so that she could be in stage in, in touch with Margot. And she moved to Toronto and got married. And um, this is one of the kind of tropes that go like a red line throughout the interview and also throughout the play that every so often I would push Margot on her relationships and whether she reflected on the queerness. And she was definitely kind of the generation of a lesbian who thought in, in, in hard categories as we today do not speak as we speak about queerness and acts and practices and not about lesbians and bisexuals and straight people. So she was part of definitely that narrative and we had conversations about that and she would not bulge one centimeter. Um, so she, for her, basically the women who could love men and would not choose to love more women than Bagot were for her not lesbians and that's something that she kind of categorizes over and over but they always stayed in touch and <clears throat> I mean you see this very moving end where uh, Emma is sick with cancer and waits to actually die until Margot comes to say goodbye and then I would just oh sorry no no but go I ahead I would just add, uh, you know, the, um, the ways in which people lost touch and then, you know, found one another, etc., um, was a very confusing time. And so, for me, I think some of the, you know, one of the things we didn't want to do was to wrap things up. I think too neatly uh, in a bow. I think what we wanted to do was actually kind of represent that moment of, oh my gosh, I don't know what happened. What happened? Because I think. You know, anytime you're dealing with a story that goes on for this amount of time and, and you know, there's, you know, been this is pre, you know, people didn't know where people were for many years, you know, and, and some people never ended up finding them. And so I was inspired uh, in this sense by a number of um, plays that do this as well, I think in a really good way, probably the, the most famous one is a German play from the Grips Theater in Berlin called um, From Today or called Sarah and that dramatizes Inga Deutschkron's life. Um, and she had a relationship um, with uh, someone and uh, a man and um, you never end up knowing what happened in the play because they lost touch during the play, as did so many people. People were, you know, moved or having to move, you know, etc. And so um, so that was a deliberate uh, it was a deliberate choice to keep that in the piece. Mm. So relatedly, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Um, one, how did you choose what to include in the play from her testimony and what not to include? And um, is there more video footage of Margot that is available? And if so, how can we see it? Yes, there is more. There are her interviews for the Shaw Foundation and for the USHMM. Um, and I think there is even simply on YouTube, when you Google Margot Hoyman or Margot Human, um, you will find the bits. But they do not speak about her queer desire. Um, somewhat cheekily, um, uh, some exhibition in a unnamed German city did recently an exhibition about queer life in Nazism. And uh, knowing full well that we are afraid of being plagiarized, so we do not share the recordings um, and we also do not share the script of the play. But they know about my work and about our play and they went with a uh, you know, fine uh, magnifying glass over the um, transcripts from the other interviews and found like two lines that if you put them into this context, you can read them clearly. And I thought it was um, very assertive. Um, but, you know, I can't go after him. I just did not think it, it was not something that I would have done. I will say again, uh, in the last three, four years, kind of the memo has arrived that queer, his, queer people have history too, and that it's been erased, especially for Holocaust history. So people who would otherwise have not like 
listened to us for five minutes because they thought our research was horrible and woke are kind of now interested in this history, but not necessarily always in equally ethical ways. So we are quite aware that our play is precious and special, and we are very protective of it. So no, we don't share our recordings. That is true. Uh, in terms of the, you know, just the script development as well, you know, I think we knew we had a couple of frame questions, frame things that we knew we wanted, knew it wanted we it wanted to be we wanted to tell a queer story. We also wanted to tell a feminist story, and um, so we wanted to tell a story that was very Margot focused because sometimes, like I think you see this in um, depictions of Anna Frank, often you know sometimes the story really ends up being about her father, her mother, you know the sort of people around her. Um, and, and I'm not critiquing that, but I think there are, you know, again, many ways to represent these multifaceted stories, but we wanted it to really elevate the the, the things of Margaret's story that, as uh, you know, Anna mentioned, um, hadn't been told before. And so this meant that the, you know, we started with you know, hours and hours and hours, and then Anna did a first kind of past cut that was like four or five hours long and then we cut it down and then we had kind of an hour and a half and then it was going from that hour and a half to that to that kind of 45 minute mark because I wanted it to be under an hour deliberately um that was the hardest part and so what this meant was making some really difficult choices about how much we talk about Margot's family versus Margot's um relationship and we chose the relationship because the family um, had been spoken about in other avenues. And again, because you know we we didn't want to destabilize it and make it a kind of a Margot's relationship versus Margot's marriage. We didn't want that kind of fake binary. So we ended up really kind of not putting a whole lot about her marriage in there on purpose. So it wouldn't be an either or because that's not the story. Um, um, yeah. Oh, and um, I just saw uh, so Dr. Bellary's uh, question, which was about that, but then also about um, thinking about you know how we could animate the archive. We, that'll be our next project, um, Dr. Zatzman. We'll do that. We'll do that together so, real, with you. <laughs> related to the next projects, um, people are interested in knowing um, now that the world um, has um, opened up uh, to some degree uh, with COVID. Um, people are interested in knowing: Are there plans to mount live productions um, of the show? Um, and um, throughout your experience so far, including today, um, what has been your sense in terms of the audience that has been drawn? The, uh, the, the question asker noted that their assumption is that most of the people here today are queer. Um, and so there's an interest in, especially given the silencing of this history historically, um, to what degree are cis straight um, people uh, tuning in and taking in the story? Yeah, this is the elephant in the room. I mean, I, I, I also am a historian of queer Holocaust history and I am writing um, a trade book in which there are four protagonists and Margot is one of them. So I saw there were questions about what happened to Margot after liberation. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for my book. Um, and I really have to say at like 95% of my talks, the audience are people interested in the Holocaust who would come to my Theresa talk anyways, but especially in English language countries, it's young queers, young Jews, and especially young queer Jews who are absolutely aware that there is this gaping gap and that it's existentially important. And sometimes the usual suspects who would come to the same events if it were, say, on Theresienstadt or Warsaw Ghetto uh, will not show up. And when, you know, sometimes I kind of ask the organizers if I'm friendly with them, um, why did the usual suspects not come? They are like, we invited them, but they said, this is just for the queers, this is not for us normalos. And this, it's, it's really heartbreaking, the notion that while queer people listen to hetero stories as well, you know, Anna Karenina does not have many queer heroes, or Ju uh, Romeo and Juliet, there is the notion that queer stories only belong to queer people. And I, I, we are really pushing against that, and we really hope that will that will change. But it's it's an uphill battle, and we welcome all the allies. And um, we also showed it, uh, it was, well, we didn't show it, but it was shown um, in, uh, for high school students in Hamburg. And so that was necessarily um, everybody who happened to go to that high school who was of a certain um, age group. So um, it also just really depends on kind of, because we've, we've been really fortunate in sharing it in a number of different avenues and venues around the world now. 
Um, but a lot of it also just depends on that intersectional spot of which organization is um, is bringing it. But I'm, I'm really grateful for the question, actually, because I think it's really important for us to, to think about. Regarding the next steps and when we, we'd love to do it live, we would love to do it live. Um, Anna and I right now are looking at um, various funding options to make that happen when you do a show live. Um, you have to keep paying the um, amazing actors um, and, and space, et cetera. Um, or partnering with a university would be another, um, we've already done it, you know, at Portsmouth, um, but, uh, but partnering with another institution to bring it, um, somewhere else would be something that, um, we'd love to do. Well, I want to thank Dr. Hughes, Dr. Haikova, Rabbi Grushko, the Montreal Holocaust Museum that uh, organized and initiated this event and Temple Emmanuel for your co-sponsorship uh, and all of you for being here today. Um, I hope that you join me in um, really savoring this celebration of love that is at the core of Margot's story um, and also recognize that there is inspiration here um, and there's also a poignant reminder, a reminder given the silencing, the hiding, um, that we know she went on to experience. And a, so a reminder of the work that still remains for all of us to participate in. Um, so thank you for being here today. Again, um, a very joyous Pride Month to all of you. I'm gonna jump in before everyone disappears, if I may, um, truly to echo that, that thanks and to recognize both how important it is to be shaped by the stories to which we feel similarities and also to hear and be stretched by those stories where we experience difference. I also want to invite everyone, it just so happens that this Friday night, we have two speakers, one a child survivor and one a young adult who recently went on the March of the Living, Eva Cooper and Melissa Shriki, as part of our temple service. And then in two weeks, June 30th, we happen to have our Pride Shabbat service and everything that we do is available to everybody wherever they are. And so, I, any way in which these conversations can continue, I think makes all of us richer. So thank you all of you for that.